How's it going, everyone? Wayne the Unknown here, and welcome to another episode of Geeking Out, where we basically discuss everything pertaining to everything nerd and geek related. Um, tonight, we are going to be doing um, something a little bit different. I am going to be interviewing Alan Silverwood of Pop Press. Wait, is it Pop Skull Press? Pop Skull Press. Pop Skull Press Comics. How are you doing tonight, Alan? I'm doing okay. Um, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. Thank you guys for coming on, and also thank you for being my uh, first um, comic book uh, series. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. No. Well, that's cool. I feel honored. Yeah. No. <laughs> that's awesome. I wish my daughter were here because she's been kind of my co-writer, and she's kind of part of the reason that this is actually happening. So it's. I'm sorry that I don't have her here with me because she deserves some of the credit here. Um, no, I, 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 have, I, have to, I have to thank her too for you know giving me the opportunity to uh, interview you guys for this series. It's actually nice to be uh, doing this as well. So um, the name Pop Skull Press, where did that originally come from? That is, that, I'm glad you asked. It's kind of a fun story. Um, Pop Skull, I'm kind of a history buff. Um, during the Civil War, they had a term for booze or hooch or, you know, whatever they made, whiskey, whatever they were able to, you know, whip up. Um, the soldiers called it, one of the terms they used was pop skull um, for alcohol. Um, but I started writing and I was doing pop culture articles, you know, and, you know, using, using my brain and what's in my skull and I thought pop skull and I was like oh that kind of that kind of makes sense I also like to do a little mixology a little cocktail type of thing and I'm like you know if I kind of combine the two I like skulls I like ghosts and haunted things as well so I thought you know what you combine if you, if you use that term it kind of has a double meaning it's kind of fun so pop skull Boom. So I've got a good logo out of it and it's kind of a fun name. And um, that's what we are. Pop Skull nice. Press. Now, yeah. how long have you guys been um, releasing comics for uh, Pop Skull Press? We actually, you know, we finally got, um, we started out, here's the thing. We had our original comic book. We've got our original title was going to be a steampunk comic that is actually now um, complete except for lettering, and it's beautiful, and we have not released it yet. But that was going to be our first book, but steampunk takes a long time to make. Oh, no. I, so, I, I our first, so our first book, our first book, we actually started that several years ago, um, but now we are at the point where we're like, oh, okay, we've got that thing moving, but we haven't released it yet. So in the meantime... Um, we had, I had this idea that, um, I had been talking about for years. I raised my daughter, you know, telling her stories about this world and these characters and stuff. And she was fascinated that she's like, dad, why don't you do that? And I'm like, okay, let's do it. So I started doing it, you know, by this time she's an adult. So she kind of steps in and sort of kind of helps me flesh it out and do some stuff with it. Um, and we wind up kind of co-writing this thing. And the next thing you know, it's out. Um, we managed to put this thing out. Um, there was a little bit of delay because we got it out in the middle of the pandemic. The first issue came out in 2020. Um, crazy that we actually released the first issue in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so we released it toward the end of 2020, and then we were like, oh, this is good. By the time we got to the second issue, we were going to release it in spring of 2021. And, of course, with the pandemic and various artists who had members of their family with COVID or had COVID themselves, it pushed us back to fall of 2021. So we just finished the Kickstarter for the second issue. In the meantime, we did a handbook, which is kind of like the old DC Who's Who or the official handbook of the Marvel Universe type of thing. So we did that in between as that had been kind of a stretch goal thing from the first 
um, the first issue Kickstarter. So we got that out. So now we've got the first issue, the, the, hand, the first handbook, um, and the second issue has just finished Kickstartering successfully. Um, the third issue is drawn. Um, it needs to be colored and lettered. So the third issue is already ready. The fourth issue is partially written and the artist is kind of like ready to go, ready to draw. <laughs> um, and I'm like, okay, hang on. I still got this steampunk thing. I want to get this guy out. And then, of course the, 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 um, the, at the shows, I'm kind of showing some of the pages of the steampunk thing and people are like, they practically like they're practically doing the potty dance for it so i'm like okay so they're ready for the steampunk book too that's going to be a good one so i've got like okay so now we've got we've got the superhero book which is you know spies among us and then we've got the steampunk book which is sky guy and the altitude adjusters nice. so we've got these two books going um what i wanted to do what i thought was important to do um and you know coming back you know even with my pedigree you know it's like coming out of somebody who's been on the editorial staff of marvel comics written a little bit for marvel comics very little you know but you know nevertheless i wanted to show people that i would deliver and produce a comic you know that i mean that i would deliver a comic book that i produced so i went in I went all in on the first couple of issues for Spies Among Us to make sure, and the first issue of Sky Guy. I want to make sure that people know that I'm going to deliver what I'm saying I'm going to deliver. I'm not going to come out and say I'm going to deliver a comic and then not deliver it. So for Spies Among Us number one and number two, and even the, the, the handbook, I made all of those before I even offered them to the public. So that was my way of saying to people, look, here you go. I'm going to offer these to you and they're going to be out there so that you know that we're serious. We're not playing games. We are going to make these books. Now I can only do that for the first, you know, two or three issues. After that, I'm going to have to go the same way everybody else goes. I'm going to have to Kickstarter it at a more realistic goal and then we'll make the books. But now, you know, we do make the books and we deliver what we promise. You know, when we say this is going to be an interesting story in, an interesting story to follow. Sorry, I have Invisalign and it's really affecting my speech. <laughs> so you're, you're fine. <laughs> it's a thing. It's making, eh. they're a little bit weird, but um, they had to fix my jaw. So I've got Invisalign in. Um, so I've got that done. And then the first issue of the steampunk one, which I don't think is going to be a problem at all doing the same thing. Um, but Pop Skull Press also puts out novels. Um, I've got the first, book of an epic fantasy trilogy out the second book is seriously delayed it's halfway done but with everything that's been going on for the last three years and believe me it hasn't just been the pandemic it's been very seriously delayed um it's halfway through but it will be released um i've also got a book of short stories out we did a novella of the first um, of the first issue of spies among us kind of an old-fashioned pulp fictiony kind of um novella nice. version of the of the first <laughs> issue of spies among us and we may take that and go into there's a new thing called vela on uh on amazon which makes which is a perfect fit for this thing which is like you release it in like these chapters form and i'm like that would be kind of fun to do with the spies among us thing because i could take it and do kind of a thing with it with the spies among us world on there so that's another thing that may happen with that if there's enough demand you know we'll see what happens but um but the world is is pretty pretty well fleshed out you know it's been being developed for 25 years so. that's a pretty long time so it's like, like yeah since there's like a, there's the, a lot since like the night like late 90s basically yeah well actually even it, it goes Mid further 90s. than that it's it's more it's more like the third it's more like a 30 year development arc i think probably well, so like if not late, if not earlier than that late 80s, I mean, early 90s, I, I, at least yeah i i was at marvel in the late late 80s early 90s and i want to say that some of this stuff predates that so it could be even older than that mm -hmm. as far as some of the ideas some of the ideas weren't fleshed out or didn't come together until later 
but um but some of the stuff comes around from a long time ago some of this stuff um it's kind of funny some of the things that things have people have done since then um, i keep going i keep cringing i'm like i'm afraid i'm like no don't steal my idea don't do my thing <laughs> don't do my thing and it's like people are like dancing all around it but they don't actually do my thing so you don't want, like, like going, okay they haven't done my thing yet so you don't have to deal with really the, neat thing you know <laughs> you never had to deal with any copyright issues with your guys's comics no i haven't had any problems with that yet no that's good so you no said issues. you worked uh for marvel over back in the late back in the 80s and 90s what was that like working for such a a well-known uh comic book franchise you know it's 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 kind of funny it's like you know um when you walked in the door mark grunewald the the great mark grunewald who was he kind of like oversaw you when you came in the door as the as as the new member of the editorial staff he had you know, weekly meetings for the new guys. And he brought us in, he trained us and kind of stuff. Um, one of the things he used to tell us is like, he's like, if comic books, if reading comic books is your hobby, now that you work here, you better get a new hobby. Because, you, you know, once this is your job, you're going to want to have another hobby. Um, turned out to be kind of true. What happens is when you're working and you're doing it all day long, every day, the last thing you want to do is go home and read a lot of comics. So for a long time after that, I didn't read a lot of comics. Um, but, you know, up to that point, I was a comic fiend, of course. That's kind of how I went there, was reading Mark's remarks. He did a, a, a series, you know, of, um, he had a little column called Mark's Remarks, and he kind of told you how to break into comics back then. And I followed it to the letter, and I wound up at Marvel Comics. But, um yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking at him right um, now. He definitely, he definitely has like a big mustache. Yeah, he was a great guy. I mean, he was such a great guy. He was a really nice guy. He was very funny, um, very lively. Um, it was a terrible, terrible loss for the comics world. He did amazing things. I really, really think he was one of my top influences in comics. He did really neat stories. People don't realize some of the things that he did and how influential he was. I think some people don't really give him the credit he deserves uh, for some of the stuff that he did. Um, some of it, some of it really has come out in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In fact, I mean, they just did um, the, the Falcon, the Winter Soldier and that, that kind of that part of that whole storyline with um, John Walker and the U S agent and stuff that, that's right out of Mark Grunewald. Yeah, I was you know? I was looking at some of his comics. Yeah, he there's like one where it showed um, Captain America versus U, uh, the U.S. agent. Yeah, that's right out of Mark Grunewald's storylines. That's straight out of him. You it's know, crazy. Um, he did some really, really good stuff. He did some really good social commentary in a lot of his stuff, and I think he gets. I don't know why he doesn't get the credit he deserves. It's kind of a shame um it seems like he doesn't get quite the um the notoriety that i think he deserves but anyway so work so going into work there it, it was like um you know you walked in and and um you know i walked in and suddenly you're walking around with all these people that you'd already heard of you know you're walking around with all these famous people and then they're your co-workers you know <laughs> um you know, like here I am working with these people I've heard of. Um, and it's a funny story, too, because how I wound up there was um, Richard Starkings, who worked for Marvel UK, um, wound up moving over to the United States and staying in the apartment that once belonged to Bobby Chase, who was an editor on The Incredible Hulk and Ghost Rider and G.I. Joe. She had moved out of the apartment and he took over her apartment in Brooklyn. And he asked me, he, I had met him in San Diego and we'd made friends. And he said, if you're really interested in coming to work here, why don't you come out and apply? Bobby Chase's assistant has just left and she's going to need an assistant. And I'm like, all right, I'll come out. I was already working in a publishing house. So I went to New York. I just packed everything up, went to New York. I didn't know anybody except Richard. And <laughs> boom, I was there. Um, so a week later, I'm living in my boss's old apartment <laughs> and working for her so it's like i'm 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 living in your old apartment and i'm working for you and that's and 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 i was working on the incredible hulk and 
Ghost Rider and G.I. Joe and She-Hulk. And um, I was working with um, the, it was, it was the run with Peter David and Dale Keown where they actually merged the Bruce Banner and the Hulk personalities into the one Hulk, which was the smart Hulk. Um, I worked on that storyline. It was amazing. Peter David was doing some great stuff on that. And of course, Dale Keown, his art was great. Um, I worked on, um, I did a lot of work on Go on um, G.I. Joe. In fact, um, we talked to Hasbro while I was working there. We went to Hasbro because we kept getting letters from, from fans who were always asking, why is it that none of the Joes ever get killed? <laughs> Why is it that we keep getting all these new Joes and nobody ever dies? These guys never get killed. How is this even possible? You know, they're they're a counter terrorist squad. Nobody gets killed. They were well, like, I mean, they weren't you, buying it. Unless you count so, the unless you count the movie that came out a few years ago where they killed. Well, yeah, but this, we're we're talking about like 1990. Oh, well, point, like you know? the, I didn't know there was GI Joe comics. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. There was. We. They were. In fact, it, the GI Joe comic at one point was out selling the X Men. It was so popular. Um, just prior to the age that I was there. Yeah, G.I. Joe comic was super popular in the early 80s. It was outselling the X-Men. It was so popular. But yeah, so I, you know, I actually was like, I was like, well, let's talk to Hasbro. And so they were like, well, okay, we'll do it. So um, so I was working with Larry Hama, the great Larry Hama and Bobby Chase. And the, the, the three of us flew to Hasbro in Rhode Island while we can't actually do a storyline where maybe some of these guys actually don't make it out kind of thing and they finally let us do it so we did that um and we did that and then all these fans who were complaining that nobody ever you know didn't make it out wrote us a lot of letters going how could you do that <laughs> you know they, they didn't like that either it was like there's no making i'm happy so we did that um and then I started doing the dossiers in the back. I had Larry. Larry did a, the first couple because it was Snake Eyes and um, like Storm Shadow. And then after that, I did several of the uh, several dossiers of the Joes that were real popular. Um, definitely got the fun, definitely got the, a lot of writing for comics under your belt. That's for sure. They're they're like who's who. Well, I did. The, the, the funny thing was that. Um, uh, coming from the, I was coming from the West Coast to New York. So one of my dreams, also my favorite character was the original Hawkeye, you know? Um, so one of my dreams was to write the West Coast Avengers. So the first job, the first writing job for a story I got was a West Coast Avengers annual backup, writing a West Coast Avengers story. Well, you, so you, I helped, wrote, you helped with the West Coast Avengers? I wrote a West Coast Avengers annual backup story with, um, with um you know with hawkeye in it i was like i mean <laughs> it was like that was like my first story for them and i was like how could i possibly top this you know it was it was like man that was the best thing i could have hoped for um yes yeah, so that was one of the things i wrote for them um um but yeah i also worked on ghost rider and that was when we revived him that was the first the first revival of ghost rider um, when Howard Mackey brought him back and we were working with Mark Texera and Javier Salteres and we brought brought him back the Danny Ketch version um, that was that was massively popular um, beautiful book um, and then I was working on She-Hulk which Steve Gerber had just taken over Steve Gerber is the guy who invented Howard the Duck I've he heard, yeah, I, I've, I've, I've heard, I'm familiar with Howard the Duck and how yeah, Disney yeah. was not too happy with him, how he looked like Donald Duck. Yeah. But yeah, now Disney, that's, now that's Disney cool. owns Marvel, so, you know, you can get away with it now. <laughs> they should do a crossover. That would but, be, you know, that'd be pretty cool to see. But, um, but you know, we, what, 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 uh, what, uh, what we were doing is um, um, when I started working on that book, we were working with a very young Brian Hitch. Who's he? Brian Hitch, yeah, who's Brian Hitch? <laughs> it was a very young Brian Hitch was was working on She Hulk when I started there, so I got to work with a very young Brian Hitch. He was just cutting his teeth at that point. Um, that was pretty cool. That was pretty neat. And um, and then we, you know, we had a few other special projects. One of which was a Silver Surfer graphic novel 
written by Stan Lee. So I got to I got get to work a little bit on a Stan Lee project. Yeah, I'm just looking up Brian Hitch right now. Help with Marvel, DC. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian Hitch is he's been amazing. <laughs> you got he's to done work a lot you, of stuff over you, the years. See, look like you got to work with quite a few legends in the comic book world. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's and that's definitely yeah. impressive. These are amazing guys. Least. We worked on a, uh, a, a like a two part um, She Hulk special with Dwayne McDuffie. Um, I believe Dwayne McDuffie wrote that, and that I'm pretty proud of too. Working, having gotten to work with Dwayne McDuffie because he's another legend, and and for a lot of reasons, um, he's amazing. Um, he went on to go to Hollywood, and and he created the, or um, he helmed the Amazing Justice League cartoons, um, which were which were so good back in the 90s and um i think he was static shock he either created it or helmed it um he just he just did a lot of stuff he was just very very creative incredibly bright and just one heck of a nice guy my first my first thanksgiving in new york city was three guys it was me Dwayne mcduffie and gregory wright um, just three of us. We had Thanksgiving Day. That was my first. I'd only been in New York like a month at that point. I didn't know anybody. And just the three of us had Thanksgiving together. It was it was great. Actually, it was really cool. I'll never forget it. Yes. Yeah. No. I mean that. I mean just. Yeah. Again, I'm also like I said, looking up Dwayne McDuffie st wrote Static Shock. Oh yeah. No. Uh, I mean he's famous. I mean he, he like award winning, well, massively yeah. famous. Yeah. Oh, I'm just I'm looking at Static Shock's original outfit design too. Yeah. 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 Cool stuff. Man. It's very cool stuff. So, um, what inspired you to want to write for com uh, write for comics? <laughs> you know, here's what's funny. I was five. I was probably about five years old, maybe even a little younger. Somewhere around the age of five, I remember sitting in the living room, like at the coffee table, drawing um, the stick figure story of what I called Trash Can Man. It was a stick figure, and you, they, you know, they used to have these metal trash cans with the metal removable lid. Yep, you know? I remember those. He had one of those like turned over, like the bottom was cut out of it. Mm -hmm. So he turned it over on himself like a suit of armor. He just wore it like kind of over himself like armor. And he had the lid like a, like a shield and he had a sword. And his enemy was like the garbage truck. But the garbage <laughs> truck had these giant teeth and it was always coming after him and he was always fighting it. You know, that was, it was his enemy. And I was doing, I was doing comic books. I didn't know what I was doing. I was four or five years old. I had never read a comic book. I didn't even know. I was just creating this thing. I didn't know what a comic book was. I didn't know what I was doing. So I was channeling comic books before I even knew what comic books were. And that was four or five years old. And then by the time I was like seven or eight years old, I was reading The Hobbit, and The Lord of the Rings, and got into all of that, started reading books. And then I went back into comic books when I was probably in my late teens. And I, and I stumbled across Frank Miller's Daredevil story. And I stumbled across The Watchmen. And of course, that was like, that was it. I was in. You were hooked and, right um, away. Yeah, between between all of between all of the, the 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 epic fantasy I'd fall in love with, plus Star Wars and science fiction, and then this incredible bunch of comic books I had discovered, I was done. My goose was cooked. <laughs> so I was like, you know, and then I found, and then I, and then I started going to San Diego. Now back then, San Diego was still the biggest Comic Con in town, oh, yeah. but back then. It was nothing like it is now. You could actually still go in, walk up, meet the creators and have conversations with them. It wasn't like now where it's like you walk in and it's like you're lucky. And you're paying like to the table. 300 bucks for like a yeah, day or so. It, and it was nothing like it is now. It was like. I've, I mean, I've, I've heard stories from other interviewers I've done about San Diego Comic Con and how different it was back in the 
yeah. the late eighties, early nineties. And how yeah, it is yeah. Now. it was great. That's how I, I mean, that's how I managed <clears throat> to meet Rich. Uh, he was over here and he was talking about some of the stuff that Marvel UK was putting out that I happened to have read. And he was impressed that somebody had even heard of it. And I'm like, Oh yeah. So we talked about it and he found out I was from LA you know, I could just did this quick trip from LA down to San Diego. So he was like real interested in LA. And I'm like, well, come up, I'll show you around. And, you know, we just made friends. And, and then he went back to UK and then moved to New York. And, you know, the rest I've already told you. So that's crazy. You know, yeah. That's, uh, it was just kind of funny, <laughs> serendipitous. I mean, I think it was meant to happen. Oh, it yeah, just I mean, seems like I had this real weird thing. I have the ADHD thing and, um, and then I had, you know, I had my daughter and then a son. I kind of, uh, what happened was after I, after I left Marvel, I like to say I went to Hollywood before Marvel did, because when I left Marvel, I went to, I went back to California. I was trying to fix up a broken marriage and I went to, I went to California and I went to work for Paramount Pictures. So I was working at Paramount Pictures for several years. What were you doing um, with, what were you doing with uh, at Paramount? Um, home entertainment, you know, um, I worked on the campaigns for movies like Braveheart, Forrest Gump, and Titanic, um, Jeez. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like the most famous guy you'd never heard of. Well, right? no, I mean, I, I think, <laughs> I, I think what, you know, for being, uh, like I said, for being my first comic book writer guest, cause I've, I've talked to like comic book artists for another podcast series i do called knowing that artist so you know being the first uh comic book writer for knowing that comic book writer i mean that's again uh, impressive and plus also you saying you have your uh daughter's help what's that been like having your daughter's help for uh pop skull press she, yeah she's and she and you know, she's my co-writer on spies which is which is just it, i mean i love it i love her so and there's 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 a little idea thing that i was sitting at lunch with my son one day, and we were coming up with funny names for characters with silly powers that would be useless. And then it's like, wouldn't it be funny if they came together? And it turned out that, like, together their powers were actually useful. And then I started developing a backstory and an actual story for some of these characters and went off and actually even developed one of the characters. And then he went off to college and now he's in college and I'm going, well, do I wait till he's done with college or do I just keep developing this thing? <laughs> what, what, what am I supposed to do here with this thing? And I'm like, well, I've got other characters that fit this story. Should I just blend them in and then move forward or what do I do? And I'm like, I've got enough projects as it is. I need to finish some of these books too. You know, it's like, and those take a lot more work. So I kind of have a lot on my plate and I, I don't really need more. And then of course, I haven't told you what I've been doing for the last 18 years besides writing and making comics. I've been working for Hot Wheels, Wait. which you might've heard of. Oh, I, I, I think, I think anyone... I mean, when I was a kid, I used to love Hot Wheels. I always loved the different designs. I used to, yeah, uh, I like to collect a few myself. Yeah. I think uh, that's part kid. of the reason I'm a writer too, is because they were always they used to name them. There was a play on words in in the titles of the cars a lot of the time, and I loved that because it was clever, and I thought that was fun. And I think that helped inspire my writing. You know, sort of inspire me to become a writer because I liked how they kind of had a clever play on words on the names of the cars and so uh, for the last 18 years i've also been working for mattel for um for hot wheels so i've been doing that paramount so i went Marvel, from so i went from, so I went from comic books <laughs> to hollywood from comic books to movies to toys my brother-in-law likes to tease me that you've never had to grow up have you and i'm like why would i I mean, I, I, I feel like a lot of comic book artists always or will always be a kid at heart. You know, this is the kind of stuff that I mean, people like, you know, Scott Snyder, Dave, uh, George Perez and, you know, Steve yeah. Bicko and all them. They, they started, you know, as kids loving this stuff. And they know that the older they got, right. they're like, you know, well, they're like well known in the comic book universe. You know, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have such great uh, TV shows and movies or video games, stuff like that. That's the thing. I mean, I'd love it. I actually, it's really funny. One of the guys, um, when I was at Marvel, um, one of the guys that came in as an intern um, before I left, um, really nice guy, amazing guy. He does storyboarding now, um, storyboard work. Um, 
he actually sent me a picture the other day and I was just blown away. He, he said he woke up and he had a picture of my character, the black ghost from spies among us in his head and he had to draw it. So he sent it to me. He drew it and sent it to me. So he just did this, this inking of the black ghost character. And it's the one that I designed that I actually drew out and that I had always envisioned him look, looking like. And I'm like, I think that constitutes the first fan, you know, like the, the first um, fan, fan art, fan art that I've received from anyone on Spies Among Us. And it was coming from, a, you know, someone that, that I actually revere as a, as a professional you know and i'm like that was that was i was honored i was just very honored um i was very honored very blown away it sounds like you were it was um it was uh he did it he did a drawing of i don't know if you'll be able to see him if i show him to you probably and for anyone who is watching as well i mean i'll try to show you this Oh yeah, I can see. Yeah, I can yeah, see. The black ghost. It's the guy on the. Whoops, I'm going the wrong direction. There. It's uh, that yeah, guy I, right I, there. Yeah, I, I can see him, the black ghost. But I like. Yeah. I love the design. Yeah, he's a kind of a phaser character. He basically he turns into kind of like shadow, and passes through things, or he can turn rock solid hard, like black solid hard almost um, it'd be pretty cool to see it'd be pretty cool to see later down the road someone cosplaying as the black ghost i think he'd be easy to do too he's a real easy suit to make <laughs> and he's a real neat character the only problem is it's like how are you going to walk through things you know <laughs> i don't know about that but that'll be really hard to do but um, uh, he'd be a really he's a great costume i mean i think i like it but of course i designed it so he's just, but what's funny that it, like if you uh, my characters all have like like I have a character who is um, inspired by Simone Biles. So I was really like, I was really into the Olympics this year and I was very, you know, very supportive of her when she felt like she had to step down, you know? Mm -hmm. um, because one of my characters is very much um, in, um, inspired by Simone Biles. And then there's a character in there that's like very blatantly um, inspired by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, in fact, he's basically kind of, you know, not even very well disguised. <laughs> um, um, but some of the other things that inspire characters in my book, sometimes it's just like, well, he's supposed to look like this actor, basically, or something like that. But the Black Ghost is actually inspired by a tropical fish. Um, there's a, it's, it's, it's a, they, they call, they're called a clown knife. But this particular clown knife fish there's a there's a whole range of them is called a black ghost you can look up a black ghost clown knife fish and you'll see that it's black with a white stripe and um that's what the black ghost was actually originally inspired by and he's probably he might be the oldest one of them in my uh, that that uh that i thought of that i originally thought of because I used to raise tropical fish with my daughter's mother, um, and that would have had to have been pre-Marvel. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm looking at it like for anyone who can see, that's what it looks like right there. And that, that yeah, I don't know if you can tell from that one, but uh, like, but yeah, but you can look them up and look up a few different pictures and find the ones with the white stripes and the white stripe across the back, and that's why he's got the leggings, you know. That's like, that's, like that's pretty cool. I mean, right? I, right? I, I think it's cool it's that you, you know you're it looks like an eel almost uh-huh it's an interesting fish i think that's pretty cool that you know you based a, a, a very and i turned it i turned that into a character because i thought black the black ghost and i'm like i, I, I like the name. Maybe phases in a shadow thing <laughs> yeah what, what what is funny is that apparently like somebody put out a, book, a comic book some other independent publishers put out a comic book called black ghost and he's like, I think he's, I think he's like a detective type of, type of character. 
but it's black ghost and i'm calling my character the black ghost i don't think there's a they're nothing alike i mean there's nothing there's no no i mean no from seeing that from looking at the picture and everything that you showed me yeah. um speaking of some of the artwork um how i uh from what i was told by your daughter back at uh metal or comic con you guys have like a, a good team of uh artists for your comics we do we we've been doing really well um we've been getting really good artists um craig shepherd did the first issue and he's done some really nice stuff for unparalleled comics was it unparalleled comics um he's done some stuff and that actually that picture that i just showed you of black ghost that's craig shepherd um he does some beautiful work um we had um, we had some delays. He actually stepped in to help us finish the first issue. Um, we had David Dion, who has been doing a lot of work for a lot of people, um, step in, and he did our second issue for us. Um, and he finished it really fast. And in the meantime, um, I um, I didn't know if I was going to be able to get anybody back. So I went out and found Sid Tellis. Now Sid Tellis did the third issue and he did a backup for the second issue. And he also did the cover that you'll see here on the handbook. Yeah, I remember seeing that. I think that's the one you guys said at the con. You're showing up yeah, the that's con. Sid, that's Sid Tellis. Files. That's, Cut I mean, again, art. really good work. So yeah, Sid, Sid's great. He's great. They're, they're all great. I mean, it's just, we've just had really good luck at getting getting really wonderful art. Um, I mean, everybody's just been just great, and they're great to work with. And um, looking at Sky Guy, if I could show you pages, which I don't have because I have nothing printed, but Sky Guy, um, Ryan Best has done a magical job on that book. I can't wait for people to see that thing. <laughs> I'm no, I'm definitely just, looking forward to it's it. Gonna, it's going to blow people's minds when they look at that book. I'm eventually um, looking forward to adding some pop school press comics uh, to my uh, to my to my stack a collection of comics that I have tucked we're away gonna, here. We're uh, going to get them out there. Nice. Yeah. I mean, it's I honestly think what you do and what your team does for pop school press is you know shortly amazing you know i mean it seems like you guys have definitely you know blood sweat and tears over the past couple of years and not to mention emma you having the experience working as an editor and writer for marvel comics back in the late 80s early 90s that's yeah. again yeah and uh, don't go looking for alan silverwood at marvel comics because you won't find him because <laughs> that's my pen name now you know when i was at marvel comics it was a long time ago and i was using my i was not using my pen name you'd have to find me under another name the name i was born under yeah i i, I kind of did a little bit of research just to kind yeah of did you find that yeah. Uh, yeah how you were saying how you worked for paramount marvel and yeah yeah I, I, you'll I, find I, me under under my I, birth name there i'm not don't worry i'm not gonna say you're if anyone wants to <laughs> if they want to dig into it they can dig into it it's there i, I, it's I just wanted there. i wanted to do a little research before going into this just so i have yeah. an idea yeah yeah I, I i i mean i don't know if i i don't know if i really care that much it's just that that name really never mattered to me um for various reasons personal reasons but um i use i mean my, my middle name was always alan and i always preferred it and when i you know started doing this stuff more seriously i was like you know i'm going to use that and then i'm going to take a surname from my mother's side of the family because the the other name came from my father's side of the family and he took it from his stepfather and it never really came from that side of the family anyway and i just didn't didn't see any really reason to uh to use it i mean the name itself ellen silverwood sounds like a, a character straight out of a comic <laughs> and that was that was unintentional it just kind of fell together that way and i'm like i kind of like it so i started using it on my books and then when i went into the comics i'm like i'm just going to carry it over you know I mean, I could have kept the old name because at least it connects back to the Marvel stuff. But I'm like, but the Marvel stuff was so long ago and there isn't enough for people to recognize it. It doesn't really matter. Right. You know? So. Um, now, one question I always ask any guest that comes onto this, uh, whether it be the cos a cosplayer or an actor or an artist, 
Um, what kind of advice would you want to give for first for people who are thinking about getting into writing into comics or wanted to get into doing uh, working for comics like Marvel, ah. DC, or you know stuff like that? God, you know it's what the the funniest thing is what I would probably tell people to do is go find all of the issues that have Mark's remarks that tell you how to do that. Kind of like a kind of like a, a comic uh, uh, writing uh, writing comics for dummies in a sense. Nah, you know, it's funny because he had a really good, he, I mean, Mark was great about explaining, here's how you do it. And he did this whole series. Um, I don't know how, how many, how many um, columns he wrote of Mark's remarks explaining, here's how you break into comics. But of course, the problem with that is that that was breaking into comics in the late 80s and early 90s, which is completely obsolete at this point at this point if you want to break into comics you pretty much have to just start doing it you 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 literally just just do it you know um your 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 chances of just walking up to somebody at one of the big companies and saying look at my stuff and getting them to look at your stuff and then getting hired for a job are about as good as getting struck by lightning, I think at this point. Um, in fact, in some cases, some of them are not even allowed to look at your stuff um, for legal reasons. The world has changed. So at this point, you kind of have to do your own thing. And then once you've done your own thing and established yourself with some kind of an audience or a following, you might get to the point where you can talk to some of these people if you want to get into that level. Um, but you might be better off not even trying to get to that level. You might be better off just doing something like what I'm doing. Um, you're never going to get rich at it. You know, people are saying you're never going to, you're never going to get rich at it or whatever. It's like, it's like a one in a million chance that you become somebody like, you know, name somebody who's really big in comics. You like, know? Steve, like Steve Ditko, Bob Kane, Bill Finger, all of them. Well, yeah, or or somebody from today, like um, you know, you, Scott you know, Snyder. You, Scott, yeah, you, your your chances of becoming Scott Snyder are don't don't expect that. You know, just go in and do something that you love. Make it something that you can do and that you can enjoy and that you're having fun with. Basically, do don't that. go in with don't go in with high expectations, hoping that if you make one comic, you're like boom, instant, really well known. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Go in, do something that you love and that you enjoy put it out there and show people that you love it, do it and see what you see where that takes you. I mean, I, I can tell you enjoy what you do and with you have working, you know, all those years ago with Marvel and being, you know, working with some great artists. It seems like you enjoy this because you're, you know, you're, you're your own person. You're doing your own thing or you're not like on a schedule. You're not told that this needs to be out right away. You're working at your own pace. Well, I'm not doing it for the money. No, I mean, no, 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 no. It's no. clearly I, not doing it for the money. And, 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 you know, I think, I, and, it's, it's just not, that's not how it goes. As, <laughs> I mean, as, I'd like to, I'd like to make some money out of it someday. You know, we all would, but, you know, at you this know. point, that's not happening yet. You, you know, know, when I interviewed uh, David Fielding, who voiced Zordon from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, he said the exact same thing, you know, don't go and expect you to make a lot of money, you know. So if you're going to do that, it'd be like a, an investment you know, investment broker or a banker or something like that. Yeah. But it is like something you enjoy doing, you know. I mean, the, the truth is that the, the more you do it and the more you get, the more it's, it's, it's word of mouth. The more people discover this comic, the more people I can get to take a look at it, the more people that actually sit down and read it and go, oh, wait, this is, this is good. This is not like every other thing that's out there. This is definitely something that's a little bit more like there's, it's what what this is is an epic superhero mystery there are clues in here and there are things that are going to unfold and you're going to find out things and if you pay attention there's clues for you to figure stuff out in this comic this isn't just a regular comic there's stuff in here this is set in 2012 and there's a reason why it's set in 2012 that in itself is a clue i put clues in here almost blatant kind of like a little kind of like a little easter eggs yeah, there's stuff in here. There's stuff in there. I think I think it's I think it's cool when like an artist or like a writer for you know anything for a book or comic 
or even like TV shows or something, how they always put like that little Easter eggs in. And hopefully you spot it and like. Yeah, yeah. I make it pretty. I may, I mean, I'm trying to make it accessible because I want <laughs> to make it accessible to even maybe younger readers. Like it's not just a kid's book and it might not be real, real easy, but I do want to make it somewhat accessible so that people can read it and they can kind of go, ah, I see kind of where I think he's going. They're never going to completely figure it out until I solve it for them. But they might have they might have the ability to speculate and get kind of close or go, oh, okay, I was close. You know, that's what I want. In the end, when the re- when the big reveal comes, I want them to be able to say, I was close. You know, that's what I want. You know. No, I I think that's again. You know, if if you can inspire your younger generations to get into comics or at least even like want to like get into like reading one i think that in itself is a job well done yeah yeah that too you know and and i think this is accessible to them i think that a younger audience you know i mean i don't know how young i mean you know when they ask you to you they used to always ask you to put like you know what age range would you sell this to and i'm going god i don't know it depends on it depends on the reader you know I mean, an eight-year-old might enjoy this a 12-year-old might enjoy this from what i've a, seen a 16 and year old at, might not your you know? your comics aren't like like super graphic like dared like frank miller's stuff you're, you're like your comics look age appropriate i mean there's nothing wrong with having graphic comic books but you know if you're like wanting kids to look into it yeah i mean i, I don't know about I don't, <laughs> I don't know how graphic i mean they're they're not there's not really that like there's no graphic violence in here i think <laughs> i think am i wrong I mean, well, there is a little bit. I mean, there's it's not terribly graphic. There's there there's there's I'm trying to think like into the third issue. There's some stuff. There's definitely going to be some stuff happening. I'm I'm lying if I'm trying to tell you that there's not going to be some graphic violence because there's going to be some stuff that happens. Um <laughs> there's going to be some there is a scene that's coming up in probably about the fourth issue that is horrific. But you know, I'm going to handle it as tastefully as possible, but it's, but it's going to be like an, oh my, (laughs) 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 did that just happen? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Um, Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There is, there is, there's going to be, you know, we've got, the thing is these spies, once they're exposed to the world, there's factions that are forming among them. Um, the reason that I wanted to call them superpowered individuals instead of superheroes is that I, li- each, I liked I like to play on words. Yeah, each of them has the ability to be anything. Like Black Ghost in the first issue, the first thing you see him do is save what is normally an assassin or a bad guy from mob justice. So here's a guy who's a here's a guy who's good enough to save a bad guy from basically being killed by by mob justice so it's like so that says something about what a good guy he is by the third issue he's essentially doing something that breaks the geneva convention this is the range of what you're going to see in some of these characters that they're not just good or just bad nobody's like it's not like captain america or dr doom it's like you know they might be one one moment and they might be the other the next moment. kind of like moon knight batman or deadpool well not necessarily but maybe it depends on the character it's definitely going to be really out of character though like batman if batman does something shitty to somebody it's kind of like well that's still batman that's in character same thing with deadpool but if black but black ghost does it it's really out of character you know, like they, they wouldn't expect it basically right but it's still but it still might happen you know you don't know um but you've got but you've got superpowered individuals running around who are typically not particularly good guys and then you've got other superpowered individuals running around who are not particularly good guys and they might clash with each other you know and that can lead to some pretty ugly confrontations oh i believe it (laughs) plus you've got the norms you know the non-superpowered individuals 
who are really hostile toward superpowered individuals or afraid of them, depending on, you know, where they stand. And that's all going on, you know, and there, some of them also are really just amazed, you know, because here are these superpowered individuals. Oh, and there's a little hero worship going on. So you've got factions among the norms forming as well. You know, and I'm trying to I'm trying to cover all that. I'm dropping you in the middle of chaos on the first issue. And I'm like, I can't even get to all of this because the main story is that they need to find Dr. Anonymous. And they're so busy dealing with the chaos and the fallout that they can't even stay focused on that. They're just trying to stay alive for the first few issues. <laughs> so it's like to even so there's so I'm trying to drop the clues to finding Dr. Anonymous in very, you know, in the middle of the action. You know, it's like, that's going to be kind of hard. It's, it's really, it's a hard balance. Oh, I believe we're it. Try, we're trying to keep that balance and still give you a little bit of each person's character. You know, it's like, I have to give you a little bit of their personality, a little bit. Wild Swan has such a big personality, but I try to give you some of that. You know, you're definitely getting some of her personality. There's no way you can't, you know, a um, little bit of Black Ghost personality. You're going to get a little bit of Wind Spinner's personality. You get some of Ford, uh, Fortress's personality. You're going to get a little bit of their personality in the middle of all of this. If you pay attention, you're going to get a little bit of insight into each one of them as you go in the middle of all of this chaos mm -hmm. which i think is you know it's 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 <laughs> it's 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 a balancing act definitely you know? intense because there's a lot going on oh, man. um so one more question any last minute anything that you would like to add in real quick um any um of your artists or other writers you'd like to give shout outs to who've helped you along the way with this Oh. this comic book franchise oh my gosh um there's a lot of guys there's a really wonderful community of independent comic book creators on facebook and i would be doing injustice to some of them undoubtedly because there's no way I'm going to remember all of them, but a lot of them have been incredibly helpful to me. Carlos Rafael, um, Rodney Lockett, um, Roy Johnson. Um, um, so many. It, it, I'm, I'm, I can tell you, yeah. how, I can tell you're very proud of this, 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 this in a way family of amazing creators who've helped you I along mean, the way with this with this with this comic book franchise i mean so many of them have stepped in peyton freeman has stepped in and helped me with the videos for these things um taylor esposito stepped in and did the layouts for the for the handbook um but um other guys eric bennett eric n bennett um has stepped in and done he's doing that in diversity thing which is on kickstarter right now um, it's a really neat thing that he did um, for all of the indie cre indie creators who have their own indie universes. He's done a book where he put all of our indie universes in there. Um, that was insane. That's insane. That's crazy. It's so cool. Um, um, there's just a lot of guys. I mean, if you if you can find these guys on there, they're just they're they're just um, Kurt Kurt. Kurt Christensen. I mean, I, I I just pretty much every day, any one of these guys is going to blow me away with something, and I'm going to be just overwhelmed with inspiration from them. Um, when I'm not too overwhelmed with getting online, which is one of the problems that I sometimes have now, is getting on Facebook and not just being instantly overwhelmed. But when I can actually sit there and look at at these guys and what they're doing and how they manage to continue to go out there and do it and bang stuff out every day. Um, and I, and, and I try to support them as much as possible because they are, they're doing it and they're doing it right. Um, these guys, there's just, there's a, there's a, there's a big community of guys on there and they are, and they are very, very serious and they're doing doing a good job that some of us are going to be together at jet city um in tacoma on october is it 8th october 8th i think 
eighth uh, or ninth in um, um, October eighth or ninth at, at the Jet City um, Comic Con in not Jet City. I'm sorry, it's Grit <laughs> City now. It's called Grit City. Well, this Grit City Comic Con in Tacoma, October eighth and ninth. Several of us are going to be there um, together at that Comic Con. Nice. Um, well, so this we'll video be won't be posted for a while, probably till like twenty twenty two. But I'm sure those who oh, will, well. Watch, well, for those who will watch, will have been there. <laughs> I was say for those who do who are watching this when this does come out. Yeah. Hopefully, you guys yeah. got to go to that con and see these talented, ma- amazing people from Pop Skull Press. I mean. I've, again i have to thank your daughter for being able to hook this interview and i'm glad i yeah. talked to you guys at your booth at middle art comic con yeah, I, I yeah. Been thank like, you so much for coming by i, I i've been like i said uh, looking for more things uh, to do for this podcast series and i'm glad i'm reaching out to a lot of amazing um not just digital artists but also uh you know again th- uh, for you guys being not just my first comic book franchise but also first comic book writer to talk to. So well, glad, I feel uh, like I'm, I feel really honored. And we love the chat. So I, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, I got to be able to record for uh, a new segment for, you know, get to uh, knowing that, uh, know that comic book writer. So I'll definitely, this will definitely be a, 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 a premiere to watch. <laughs> Fun. It's like, great. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to seeing how this plays back. Oh yeah. No. Uh, how, ba- how bad did I do? <laughs> oh no, you did really well. Me. I, yeah. I've done so many of these. I usually get like tongue tied during the intro and everything. So I love podcasts. I love doing them. They're fun, but I always worry that I won't like I blather you, on you, too much. You know, you did, you did really well again. Um, uh, thank you, <laughs> Alan. Um, I think that should about do it again, everyone. I'm Wayne the Unknown joined here by Alan Silverward, uh, creator of Pop Skull Press Comics. Again, Alan, thank you. Thanks very much. And again, as always, thank you for listening to this episode for Geeking Out. uh, First episode for knowing that uh, comic book writer. As always, thank you for listening. And until next time, thank you for watching.